<coughs> we formulated yesterday a few um, Ramsey theoretical <coughs> results, and it was about configurations, which are always, uh, which you can always find for any finite partition, say, of integers or any other homogeneous enough structure. And then I said it was uh, somebody's question or suggestion, and I said that we should not be greedy in Ramsey theory. We should be happy with finite configurations. If it is infinite, that's unlikely to be true. But there is one result of big interest and usefulness, uh, which deals with infinite configurations. I will formulate it now, we'll discuss it, and we'll uh, see how a sort of a soft ergodic approach we can prove it uh, painlessly. And so here is the theorem. <coughs> Heinemann. And theorem is for any finite partition of N, one of CIs contains a configuration of the following type finite sums. And I, which is by definition so let's stop for a moment and look at it and discuss it and appreciate it. So here what the claim is, no matter how you finitely partition the integers, one piece, or at least one piece to be more precise, will contain an infinite sequence, an i. You may want to think without also generality that this is increasing sequence. So it will be a sequence, an i, so that all possible finite sums taken from this sequence are still in the same column. Okay, so the closest analogy to such creatures that you should generate would be approximate semigroup. You may think about NIs as its generators, and then you take all possible configurations or sums that you can create from those generators, and there is, of course, a, and there is a restriction. We don't allow elements to be repeated, okay? I cannot take an i plus an i, but I can take an i plus n j for different i j, or an i plus n j plus n k for different indices. And this promise to be inside, inside the same color. It really looks hard to believe that this is possible. And just to, for you to appreciate that there is something maybe even deeper behind it, so here is an exercise. So, for any such object, let's uh, we'll change the name in ergodic theory. We call it IP set. Okay, so this is IP set. This is any set of this shape and form. But for any given any such object, and for any coloring. By the way, sometimes I will use this word, instead of partitioning, I will say coloring, I hope we are not confused. To partition or to color, that's all the same, and in Ramsey theory, they like to color. So that's why CIs, there are, are colors. So in any case, and for any finite coloring, CIs contains a set of the form finite sums of some MJs. So this 
makes it even more interesting. It is a sort of aberration that we started coloring all the integers and were happy with getting this object. This corollary, or indeed equivalent form, as I said, exercise, I mean, you can derive it from here. And this exercise reveals unbreakability of this IP sets structures. So if you have infinite finite sums set, you finitely color it, one piece will contain infinite finite sums. Well, better to say finite <coughs> sums of infinite sequence. Okay? Any questions? So we will prove for convenience this result, but this is really not so hard exercise. What I want to stress here, that in Ramsey theory, you eventually, after being happy with some partition results, you try to see what is the unbreakable structure inside. And so here is an exercise of another kind just to illustrate this new idea that we're developing. So, uh, fact, exercise, again, assume that some set E in N is AP rich. Some of you may remember what it means. From yesterday, it means that it contains arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions. So then for any finite coloring one of CIs is also AP rich. So here is another unbreakable thing: the property of being AP rich. Of course, the whole set of natural numbers is AP rich, but give me any AP rich set, and I try to kill this property by finite partitions. I cannot because of this exercise. So AP rich sets are stable with respect to finite partitions, and so are IP sets. So we call such things IP sets. So there is something very basic and fundamental behind these results. They are far, far reaching extensions of pigeonhole principle, actually. So you might want to think about this. Okay. <clears throat> so you may wonder how one can even approach this theorem, right? It's infinite configuration. How you get there? Sorry. Yes. Can I just ask, just to be sure uh, about the notation? So, are we calling an IP set a set of uh, uh, of the finite sums of a sequence, or a set that contains the finite sums of a, of a sequence? Yeah, very good question. It depends on whom you read. Okay. <laughs> so originally, IP sets were synonyms to finite sum sets, and then it became more convenient, and in half of the literature, that is. Executed so sets containing IP sets, sorry, finite sum sets are called IP sets, and because we deal with partitions, it really doesn't matter, right? If a set contains IP set and they finitely partition it, then because of this exercise, I in particular will finitely partition IP sets sitting inside or finite sum sets sitting inside, and by this exercise you will get IP set. So then formulation will be instead of saying contains, you can say for any finite partition of IP set, one piece will be IP set. So let's keep in mind this ambiguity, it's not big ambiguity. Either to be exactly finite sum sets or to contain finite sum sets is not so material for theorems of the kind that we are considering. Okay? More questions? Are we totally clear about the structure of these sets? So I repeat, it's approximate, <coughs> yes, please. Question? <coughs> Are multiplicative versions true? Say again? Are multiplicative versions true? Very good question. You could ask it here. Why didn't you ask here? <laughs> uh, 
Yes. If you write instead of AP rich, GP rich, and here it will be geometric progressions, it will be equally correct statement. And uh, this also a version for n times is also true. Actually, Heinemann theorem is true for any semigroup whatsoever. If you at least, uh, if it is non-commutative semigroup, then you will have to decide in which order you take the addition. Oh, it, there are actually two orders, in increasing or decreasing, when you can decide in advance. So it was a good question. The answer is yes, yes, yes. More questions, yes, please. Does the multiplicative version uh, can be derived from the arithmetic one? Or it's, uh, we have to do Sometimes you can. Here, maybe you can easily. Okay. Because let me just, in order for people not to think that this is a big deal, so thank you for your question. So if you color M, so uh, it, uh, this coloring induces just coloring of all the numbers of this form is also are colored. Right, so if the whole set of integers was colored, subset is colored. This is subset. It's colored in the same number of colors. But this set, at least um, symbolically speaking, is isomorphic to additive integers. So you get color of these numbers. It induces coloring of those numbers. Those numbers are your familiar additive integers get a progression there by Van der Waarden theorem, it will spell out back a geometric progression. Honestly, it's a cheap result because there are, you see, multiplicative integers are infinitely generated. So any one dimensional, and there are many, uh, sub semi group should have geometric progressions for easy reason. Okay? But uh, you can ask a little bit Final question, and that actually corresponds to third principle of Ramsey theory, which I will try to propagandize maybe later today already. <laughs> the first principle, remember, partition uh, regularity. Good structures cannot be broken by partitions. Second principle, you should look always for density version. We are even afraid to think what could be ver density version here, but we will get to that. And third principle is, that those configurations that you get in one color uh, should be abundant. So in particular, any oh, in positive density. So if set is large, the number of configurations of interest for you in that set would be huge in some well-defined senses, which we'll have to work on. OK, any more questions? Let me also encourage people in Kiev to ask questions. Oh, yes. didn't expect this offer. Yeah. <laughs> Here is Jakub, maybe Jakub is our agent in Kiev. In Kiev. <laughs> so Jakub, no questions there? I'm afraid no questions yet. Okay, so everything was clear. So, let us start uh, thinking how in the world to approach this, uh, the proof of this theorem. And to gain some intuition, let me invoke our old friend by now, the Poincaré recurrence theorem. Is there any connection between Poincaré recurrence and this result? So I will try to at least indicate some potential connection, and then we'll capitalize on this. And to make space, I will maybe erase this part. But before I erase, let me tell you that interaction of two kinds of structures, additive and multiplicative, that's enormously interesting thing. A lot of very good mathematics can be, you know, developed when you're interested in interaction of additive and multiplicative structures. And there are plenty of results, starting from harmonic analysis to Sarnak conjecture, which 
will be featured later this week, which really connect additive multiplicative structures in intricate way. So, so far these are separate, but you could ask more and we will. So I'm erasing now here. And so, let me remind you uh, one of the formulations of Poincaré recurrence. So maybe I still can use this space. So for any x v mu t, you remember that's such a quadruple. We call it measure preserving system. This is probability space, and t is new preserving transformation for any A of positive measure. When I say this, I mean A from my sigma algebra. Uh, there exists N, so that measure of A intersection of P and A, you can sometimes write minus to be more traditional, but we always will assume that T is inverted. So that's how Poincaré recurrence. It itself leads to a lot of interesting discussions because we should not be happy with having one such n. We want many such n's in many senses. Indeed, we want not only this intersection to be non-empty or positive. For a physicist, if this is too small a number, that may be invisible. You want it to be sizable. We will discuss this all. But for now, let us just use it for interesting heuristics. And so, so given this thing, so start with n1 such that measure of a intersection t and 1 a is positive. This is new set a1 and it has positive measure. So there exists n2 and I claim that without loss of generality is bigger than n1 and you may want to think why and this is an exercise. There exists n2 bigger than n1, such that measure of a1 intersection t, did they put minus there? Maybe minus, okay? Minus n2 is positive. But this n2 means, so let me spell it out. This is the same as to write a intersection t and 1 a intersection t and 2 a intersection t minus n1, and this will end up with this. So I didn't do anything. I just iterated Poincaré recurrence. I hope I opened the brackets correctly. I think yes. So t minus n2 a is here, and t minus n2 times t minus n1 will be here. All right, so what do we absorb? I could do it one more time, but I hope you already see the trend. Each time I apply Poincaré recurrence to previous set, so first set was a, second set was a intersection t minus n1 a, this will be my next set to apply Poincaré recurrence to, I will find n3, will shift it. And see how many elements are there? We started with one, now there are two, now there are four. When they will iterate one more time, it will be eight. But the most important thing is this. Do you see that this is beginning of creating? So we got already finite sums of an i <laughs> from one to two in powers. So if I will keep doing it, I will create longer and longer, larger, bigger and bigger intersections, bigger in sense of length. And uh, with powers belonging to finite sum sets, finite, finite sum set. But I will keep creating them in easy way, which hints to you that maybe under properly developed lucky circumstances, maybe iterative application of Poincaré-like principle can prove for me uh, Heinemann theorem. We are still far away, but we have a feeling that iterating Poincaré-like 
recurrence may be connected. Okay, that's what I wanted to, to stress. Okay. And now, to make space, I will erase a little bit here. Excuse me. Yes, please. Uh, so, uh, just to make sure that I'm understanding this correctly, so uh, wouldn't this, like if successful, give us like a shift of an IP set? No, but it would give you a shift of arbitrarily long, finite, finite sum set. Yeah, yes, but I meant, okay, if we could somehow extend this to, 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 to infinity, uh, wouldn't this, uh, so, so... If, you started with if, the answer is yes, if, then yes, but... Yeah, but my point was that we, we would get... This will not work. Okay, okay, but even if it worked, it would give a shift, right? Not just, not an IP... Well, set. there are, so you make two assumptions. First of all, if it would work. Second, you want a shift of infinite IP set, forget it. But uh, to get IP set itself, forget it. Take uh, positive, uh, uh, odd, take odd numbers. I can shift them a lot. And I will get a shift, but I, for odd numbers, I can have a chance to get IP set because it's sitting there, but not by this procedure. Yes. But yeah, so you got a feeling that maybe if we modify a little bit our ways, maybe we'll get to Heinemann theorem, but we have to decide how we'll do it. And that's what I will try to develop. I will postulate some things. It will be a lot of black boxing now, because otherwise I would have to develop too much. So take my word, those things can be properly justified. And I have a survey, which is called ergodic Ramsey theory. Well, I will write later. It's called ergodic Ramsey theory and update. And there I develop with details the background needed for what I will be doing today. Okay? So I will erase this part. And I want to introduce ultra filters convenient way from my point of view. And what is convenient way? So you heard about ultra filters if you took some set theoretical topology, I guess, or if you are into set theory or logic, but in functional analysis they sometimes use ultra products. Usually they just take a fixed ultra filter, whatever it is, and they some construction based on it. What we are doing is somewhat different. We will use ultra filters with interesting topological algebra, which was developed actually not so long ago, maybe 50 years before we started thinking this way. In any case, so what is beta m? This is so-called stone check compactification of n. And we will not use this fact, but because the resort compactification, it hints that the way I will describe it, it's actually a compact space, because it's compactification. And uh, we will not need some topological knowledge. By the way, this object has, let me define it first my way. So all 0, 1 valued probability Well, zero valued, finitely additive. Probability measures on POM. Things are getting tough. <laughs> <laughs> so you have now Finitely additive measures, zero one valued, which is already crazy, and they defined on all possible subsets of integers. Can you give me an example of such measure? That's a very tough question. Uh, what? Identical zero? I want it to be probability <laughs> measure. Good try. <laughs> <laughs> Any more suggestions? Delta measures. Good. So uh, let me define it like, say, mu sub 17 of E will be 1 if E contains 17 and 0 if, well, let me write it this way, 17 belongs to E and 0 if 17 does not. 
Success, we have infinitely many examples. Because for every 17, you will get such a measure. <coughs> no? More examples? We are in Banach Center, so Banach limits. Ah, oh, uh, I want to be defined. Uh, it, it's not unrelated, but <laughs> so in any case, now you should. I should make promises, and you should be nice and uh, accept them. So the thing is that there are many more. There are so many more that you will be surprised. The uh, cardinality of beta n is that of p of p of n. So it's huge. Now, that's already bad news. Compact space, by the way, it's Hausdorff, take my word. Hausdorff, compact space, but of huge cardinality. And now, since I told you and you agreed, you believe me that it has n, it's compactification of n. So n should be sitting densely there. And because it has huge cardinality, then it cannot be metrizable. If n would sit densely there, it would have lesser cardinality than this. So we see that we deal with crazy objects. So one has to be very careful. But uh, it is one, uh, and it's, uh, by the way, a huge subject. There is a book, by the way, Heinemann was student of uh, Comfort. And uh, Comfort uh, was specialist in uh, satirical topology and in ultra filters. And Comfort had another student by name uh, Negripontis, who wrote a huge book. Actually, the book is wrote, uh, written by both of them. It's Comfort and Negripontis, and it's called Ultra Filters. And whatever I will tell you today about is not there, because they, have, they are busy enough with other things. <laughs> so it's really a huge subject. But we will need uh, something novel, which uh, relates to algebra, topological algebra in this object. So this object is actually, and that's what we're interested in, it's actually semigroup. It's compact semigroup. And that's already promises some goodies, and we will see what it is. So those we created easily, but if I want to create others, they need Zorn lemma, so don't even try. It's, uh, it's non-trivial, logically speaking, but it's a huge space. So I will erase this part. And now we will introduce semigroup operation on beta n. So here is a hint. And we are in Banach Center, so there may be harmonic analysts here. What do you do with measures? Harmonic analysts, what do we do with measures? <laughs> Convolve them. So let's define operation of convolution. But because my measures are crazy, they are finitely additive, zero one valued, I will formulate it in very discrete terms. So here's the definition. So, ah, by the way, I forgot to tell you that it is customary to identify uh, ultra filters. By the way, they are called ultra filters. And it's customary to identify ultra filters with uh, sets uh, or identify any ultra filter, so you call it mu, with the family of sets E such that mu of E is 1. And for those of you who saw in course of topology filters, this is ultra filter because it's maximal filter. That's explain, explaining the terminology. And now it's also customary to denote ultra filters by letters P, you, and if you're out of letters, S, T, and so on, okay? So it's a little bit unusual. So little p is a family of sets, which have measure 
one. So we call them, if P is fixed, we care only about P large sets. P large means belonging to this family, means having measure one. And uh, it's convenient to denote them by small letters because there will be elements of beta n and we will do some, start doing some operations on them. And so I'm defining now So, operation of convolution. So, how do I define it? I should tell you when, given P and Q, this is definition, given P and Q, two ultra filters, I should tell you when set E is P plus Q large. And definition is here. It is P plus Q large if and only if those n for which e minus n belongs to p belongs to q. This is the toughest formula we'll get today, so let's stop and look at it. And um, it's also a good exercise to, to see behind this how familiar convolution with integration. So in any case, what, how can we interpret this? Set e belongs to p plus q if p many shifts of E belong to Q. That's what I wrote and I just spelled it out. It's something to get used to and let us admit that it gives you a bunch of exercises. So exercise is first P plus Q is well defined. It's not even clear a priori that this is an ultra filter. This uh, second plus operation is associative. And three plus is badly non commutative. So these are routine exercises. This one, honestly, I don't uh, see easy way. So everyone knows it, and uh, every now and then I have a very smart student who actually proves it. Let's consider it as a bonus exercise. Let's not worry about it. Just don't think naively. Oh, by the way, this I should mention. If you specify P and Q to those measures, you remember, delta measures, then this is nothing but addition on N. So this operation extends our usual addition on n. That's important remark. So maybe I should write it here. Plus extend the usual plus operation on n. So now we again see how crazy it is. Uh, on n it was nice additive semigroup, uh, commutative semigroup. We extended it to compactification. We still have semigroup. We lost commutativity badly. No, and maybe now some more experienced people can guess why we should not expect commutativity a priori, and there is no commutativity. But why this is not so surprising if you dealt with convolutions? Namely, why it is not surprising that defined with the help of convolution operation is actually non-commutative when we started with commutative group. By the way, in classical harmonic analysis, you have nice locally compound group, you have measures, you convolve them. Uh, this operation is nice, and here it's not, not as nice. Why? What fails? Say it again. Say it louder. Well, we deal with ultra filters, but what fails? Why? Why it is not commutative? Additivity, maybe. What? Additivity. You have additivity. Because no, no, keep going. Because it is only finitely. Additive. Very good. It's only finitely additive, and when you do convolutions and check things, you use Fubini theorem. You can say that you wanted to. So you use <laughs> Fubini theorem, and Fubini theorem for finitely additive measures is not 
there, not always. Okay? So that's the reason. In any case, we have an operation. Now, look what we have already. We have an operation. I didn't define any topology, so take my word, it's half continuous operation. So if I would write lambda p of q, which is p plus q, so this is uh, continuous for any p. That's why it's half continuous. When any fixed p, as function of q, it is continuous. It's really, since you promised, didn't you, to trust whatever I give you as black boxes, trust this fact too. What is more important is that because of this fact, our semigroup becomes semi-topological semigroup, whatever it means. It is topological because it is compactification, it's complex space. It's semi-topological because operation is only half continuous. That, it turns out to be enough, so by Ellis lemma, beta n has to contain an idempotent. And what would it mean? So P, which is P plus P. By the way, I forgot to tell you that those delta measures, they're called sometimes principal out of it. And the rest are non-principal. And the uh, idempotent cannot be principal. So there is already some mysterious object which is idempotent just because of general algebra, or because of general topological algebra. I'm going to use this idempotent ultra filter to prove Heinemann theory in a moment. But let us spell out what it means. We have definition here. Let us take p equal q and try to interpret this definition for p equals q. So this means that e belongs to p if and only if e belongs to p plus p. And this is if and only if those n for which e minus p belongs to e minus n. Sorry belongs to P, belongs to P. Now let us look carefully at this. In the way we interpret it, what it means. For P many shifts, the resulting set is P large. When I say P many, I care only about those which are visible from my measure point of view. So I can say almost every, in sense of my measure, almost every shift of E, is still of measure one. So if E was of measure one, then almost every shift is of measure one. Don't you think that we have a sort of measure preservacy? If you are ready to disregard those ends which are not good as set of negligible measure from point of view of P. So almost every shift of E still has, and this, you remember we had, I erased it already. In Poincare recurrence, we start with measure preserving transformation. If I would define measure preservacy as happening only with respect to almost every uh, element, it would be not so bad. And that's what we have here. So it's very abstract, very soft measure preservacy. Measure is crazy measure. It's zero one valued, finitely additive measure. And pre measure preservacy is up to only uh, those things which we care about. So for P many, namely for almost every n, a minus n, or e minus n is uh, p large. We'll be using it now. Now you remember you had optimism about getting uh, IP sets. Your optimism will come through right now. So I want now to erase things, so, because I need two full lines. So maybe I will, I will erase this one. So let us see our Poincaré recurrence, a variant of Poincaré recurrence is this. So if uh, E is E large, then For P many 
n minus n is p large. But it means that E intersection E minus N is also P large. So far I didn't do anything really unusual, right? I took large set. If this shift, if this shift is um, equally large, so their intersection should be large. And that's the sort of Poincare recurrence. Remember, A intersects A minus uh, T to the NA. But there is one extra feature which I want to stress now. And that's important. Important. We can choose n, which n, this n. From E. Oh, that's improved Poincare recurrence. So I will maybe formulate it again, but why? Very simple. The set of good ends is itself element of P. So if you intersect uh, the set which is large with the set of ends which do it, it's easy to see that this end can be chosen for me itself. So this is improved Poincare recurrence. And I will start iterating. Yes, please. So this is assuming that P is uh, it important. Yes, right? yes, it's uh, here. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Recurrence for this. Well, let me not make more <laughs> lines here, but yes, I am assuming that P is it important. Yes, please. So what is the idea of the proof of Ellis' lemma? Is it, does it use a measure theory or is it more in the framework of this semi-logical semi group? Exactly. No, it's nothing measurable about Ellis' lemma. It's a general, you see, it's a not so hard exercise if you have a compact metric space which simultaneously is a semi-group, normal semi-group, topological semi-group. It will have always an input. Ellis lemma is just a way of proving it by using only semi-topological property, and you use Zorn lemma, by the way. So pay attention, this is the second time that we're using. First of all, we used Zorn lemma to create beta n. And now we use Zorn lemma to create idempotence. If I will have time today to get to minimal idempotence, it will be Zorn lemma third time. And Heinemann once told me a story. He was giving a talk and introduced minimal idempotence, which we didn't introduce yet. <clears throat> and he he jokingly said, well, you know, we will use Zorn Lemma again to get minimal adipotence. And somebody in the audience said, well, you used Zorn Lemma once to get better. Use it second time to get idempotent property. And now you want to use it third time? That's not too much? <laughs> Can I believe your mathematics? <laughs> so in any case, you use Zorn Lemma as we feel uh, appropriate. Well now, we didn't, <laughs> well, now we didn't get to minimal wide importance yet. I want to capitalize on the existence of wide importance. OK. So, and by the way, and where is Heinemann theorem here? I will take, so, proof of Heinemann theorem. So, fix p equal p plus p, uh, then one of CIs in our partition will be P large. Call it C for convenience, okay? So I start with this partition. I fix an idempotent outer filter, so by property of zero, one, valued measures and all that, one piece should be P large. Actually, one and only one if it is partition. I will work only with this piece. Before I forget, maybe we'll try to understand. Uh, As usual, pray. As usual. <laughs> uh, 10 to 15 minutes. Just that. <laughs> okay, okay, so at least we should finish Heinemann. So Heinemann we will finish. And so pay attention. Maybe a notion of largeness is lurking here behind the scene. Because I will work with C, which is P large. 
So I will create AP set in a large set. So maybe being a member of idempotent outer filter is the notion of largeness, which is behind so-called density version. So instead of talking about density version, we should talk about largeness notions which are behind those theorems. So it's no longer upper density DVAR, but it is membership in idempotent outer filter, which is behind the thing. And now let's prove him. So, so there exists N1 in C, pay attention, such that C intersection C minus N1 is in P. Remember, we denote measure one by membership in the family of sets which are P large. What I wrote here is just this. I took a set, I shifted it by self element, it's a self shift, and I got this. This is the beginning. And now if you remember what I did with Poincare recurrence, you should guess how it will go. So take now N2 such that <coughs> C intersection C minus N1, this was a set, call it, think of it as a new set, right, to deal with. And you take this set, intersection C intersection C minus N1 minus N2 will be again in P. And by the way, I should be a little more careful, such that, let me be more careful, such that N2 belongs to C intersection C minus N1. Okay, that's important. And now let us analyze this. So, by the way, I want to hope that you understand the procedure. I will keep choosing new NIs and uh, shifting and being happy. So when I will choose N3 from this set in order to make, again, new iteration, see what I'm already generating. N3 will be in C. N1 was in C. N2 is not only in C, but it is in C minus N1. So N2 plus N1 is also in C. And this N3 plus N1 will be in C, plus N2 will be in C, and plus N1 plus N2. So I already created, so this procedure already gives me finite sums of Ni's from 1 to 3 in C. And I should write and so on. And this is end of the proof. Ask your question. So, there is a, there is a question, question in Kiev. Yes, please. Uh, should there be in the last line uh, minus and two also in uh, brackets? Uh, no, no um, uh, Here. Very, yes. Very good. You have sharp eye. People in Warsaw didn't see that. <laughs> Thank you. Now it's okay, right? How about this, just to be safe? <laughs> <laughs> not enough. It looks like not enough. This is what yes. I said. You know what? Now it's better. <laughs> <laughs> now I think it's fine. Okay? Yes, yes, thank you. Um, and uh, another question. Uh, could you please remind what is P large uh, in uh, our presentation? This is measures. Any set is P large if for a fixed measure it has value one. Yeah, thank you. If P is associated with my measure, I can, instead of measure, think about the P large sets, namely sets which have measure one, because it's only zero one value that's very well defined. Okay? Yes, thank you. Okay, good. People, you are closer to the blackboard. You could ask this question yourself. <laughs> so we have nice zooming features here. So. <laughs> so, what's your question? I have a nice question. I'm not sure where we use the convolution. Oh, I defined convolution here. I took special case P equal Q here. And uh, I can just write what I wrote because I defined convolution the way I defined. More questions? Do you realize that we proved Heinemann theory? <laughs> now I still have seven minutes. I have a yeah, please. Can we generalize uh, more Heinemann? 
what do you mean generalize? Ah, you know, since he gives me only seven minutes, let me do what I wanted and please ask this question after I will be done. That's a new method of prolonging your talk. <laughs> Delay questions until after the talk. I think we started a bit later. Yeah, and we started late. <laughs> just, just a bit. <laughs> yeah, but you will ask just when I will be done. So uh, there is a, there are many more applications of ultra filters and indeed I important ultra filters in ergodic theory of multiple recurrence and through this back to combinatorics and I want to define one more to explain one more application. If there are no more questions about Heinemann theorem and its proof, it was just iterated. Uh, infinitely iterated Poincare recurrence, really. Here I could continue ad infinitum. Okay. So, we proved time. I am erasing some something. I am erasing this. By the way, it's not bad, three lines. And uh, Heinemann's original paper was 20 plus pages, very hard to read, but then somebody, so there is history about this, maybe if you read in my surveys. Somebody who took a course in topological dynamics in Minnesota from Ellis, he happened to know about the uh, existence of idempotents. <laughs> and he explained to those people, because people at that time were not sure if there are so-called almost shift invariant ultrafilters. And because of Ellis Leber, there are. These are exactly now language idempotent uh, ultrafilters. And then the result of this beautiful and, and Lucky connection is this very, very nice proof. The original proof of Heinemann also used ultrafilter? No, original proof of Heinemann didn't use ultrafilter. And uh, it is 20 plus pages. Good luck. <laughs> but it used Tornlema, probably. Uh, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> no, I say maybe because, uh, okay. You have to give me a few minutes because I'm answering questions yeah. after the talk. <laughs> you see, Heinemann theorem can be carefully formulated. I'm now quoting logician friends. I'm not logician. But uh, I uh, am told that if you prove a result which needs only not overly sophisticated, logically speaking, language, and whatever proof you gave to it, then there exists a proof using no zone level. And so indeed, Heinemann proof actually could be rewritten with no Zorn, if you like such things. Okay. So I will erase this to make space. And now, since ultrafield, there's amp measures and define notion of largeness. So here is so, uh, definition. Let X be a topological space. Let uh, Q be a non principle for, con for, for convenience ultra filter. We say that. E lim xn equals x. So xn is a sequence in x. If for any neighborhood the set of n such that uh, Xn belongs to U, belongs to Q. Is the definition clear? So this is what? What is not principle again? Uh, not delta measure. It would be just too dull. Okay, so that's very decent. Those of you who are familiar with convergence and density and all that, so each time you have a notion of conalness and sets which are not in my view are conal, you can define generalized notion. The closest, by the way, and that's maybe practitioners of traditional mathematics know the strong uh, Cesaro convergence. 
deals also with sets of density one. And the definition there would be very simple. So in any case, we have notion of convergence. And now I will give an example of, by the way, so if x is compact metric, say, for convenience, then for any p, for any q, p lim, q lim, uh, exists and is unique. Okay, so, and the, the natural way to use p-limits is to take, now I will say things which belong to functional analysis, take a Hilbert space, say separable Hilbert space, take its unit ball, its weakly compact, compact space. You can use now p-limits and maybe get somewhere. And suppose you have a unitary operator, it preserves your unit ball, and you can get somewhere. You can get analogs of ergodic theorems. Very useful. So I will give you an example of such application of this ergodic thinking applied to what we care about. It's Poincare recurrence for now. So so theorem for any x b mu t for any a of positive measure for any p equal p plus p. That's my outer filter. P lim of mu of a t n a is bigger or equal than mu square of a. And now let's interpret it, and maybe this will be all for today. Have other things in mind. Though. So people, let us understand how much better than Poincare recurrence is this here. There are two things here. First of all, very big intersection. So this is as big as mu square away, potentially. Second thing, which is very, very important, it's here. And now I will interpret this result in combinatorial terms. And I need, so I will not use it anymore, so I will erase this part. What is the square on the right-hand side? What? What is the square on the right-hand side? There is a mu square. Yeah, so this is the same is as. A no, no, no. Mu of a square. It's a number. Ah, okay. 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 What is q? Q where? Here was an important p, and here was any ultra filter q. Oh! Oh! Q. In this case, p equal. What is q? It is p. Yeah, so sorry, it was my time. Thank you for asking. So, you see, I didn't want you to have impression that I'm defining it just for idempotent ultrafield. But when you use convergence along idempotent ultrafield, you can, can get new goodies, which I will not have time for today. In any case, uh, so here is the interpretation, and one of them would be this. So for any x b mu t, for any a of positive measure, the set of returns, big returns really, and mu of and for any epsilon, the set. Let it be invertible, okay? Positive, not positive, bigger than mu square of a minus epsilon. So I'm writing mu square, it's square of a number. Uh, is IP star meaning that it has non trivial intersection. with any IP set. You remember IP sets are just all possible sets of this form. Well, this IP star, which means inter non-trivial intersection, is coming from this quantifier. You see, every P 
test the property, we, if you paid attention, when we proved Hein, when we proved that any member of idempotent outer filter, and we chose it to be C, has a subset which is IP set. That's how we proved it. And then, so those IP sets then should show up here because filling gives you notion of largeness, right? So if this set belongs to P, it will have subset which is IP, so I will have a trivial intersection with IP set which comes from P. Any IP set which comes from any P, because any IP set coming from any P, this is, it is then any P. Reformulate the Hindman theorem? No. We use Hindman. Behind this is Hindman. Well, Hindman has its own in generalizations which are of interest, but here we are applying it to measurable dynamics. Indeed, through this, to combinatorics. Here is application. So it implies that if E is in N, say positive density, then the set E minus E, which is all X minus Y, X and Y in E, is IP star. You may now should be comfortable with IP star. Set is IP star if it has non-trivial intersection with any IP set. That's a good way of defining notions of largeness. For example, set in zero and interval is dense if it intersects non trivially every subinterval. Non trivial subinterval. Set is IP star if it intersects non trivially any IP set. If you intersect non trivially any IP set, this implies, and much better than, a syntheticity. I gave you an exercise to prove syntheticity, and here is also implies syntheticity. Syntheticity in Poincare theorem can be proved directly. Here we prove a stronger property. And this is application, you may to see why from here some fact about sets of differences, because it's really about density of E intersection E minus N. So if I will have N for which this set This is combinatorial version of this. By first term correspondence or any other way, you should see them as very similar results. Ends for which concurrent recurrence happens, ends for which combinatorial recurrence happens. These are the same results. In this specific case, they can be proved separately and independently. This was one of the exercises, by the way. But what is interesting now, and this will be the final point for my talk, I can do how about this. By the way, this square is square of n. So I'm interested in Sarkozy. Is there any chance that Sarkozy can be amplified so significantly? You remember from yesterday Sarkozy. It's one career recurrence along squares. Now I claim. So let me erase this part and put here square again. Now, of course, I'm hiding a little bit some information because P lim here is so good because limits, limits of unitary operators in Hilbert space, they are projections, they are orthogonal projections. And very pleasant novelty is that if you take P limit along polynomial action, it is still orthogonal projection. And this is what you don't have for Cesaro averages. So from that point of view, P limits are better than familiar and traditional Cesaro averages. And it comes not so hard. And uh, don't know what you like more. This is, I think, pretty impressive generalization of Sharpies. What are you saying here, that the set is what? The set is, let me use here, the set is IP star. Hence, I said it, but let me, let me stress it. It's an easy 
exercise to show that any set which is AP star is synthetic. Synthetic, if you remember, this is a set having bounded gaps. If I have a set which is AP star, and if I would assume that it is not synthetic, it would have a bit really large gaps, and in those gaps I can insert an IP set, and it will contradict IP star. So IP star is stronger than synthetic. And that's what you get. So I had additional applications, but I will stop here. Let me just summarize. So on one hand, notion of largeness coming from idempotent ultra filters allows you to prove neatly Heinemann theorem, which itself is an achievement. But if you start using convergence along idempotent ultra filters, you know, sky is the limit. Because here we just did it with Poincare. Why don't I go to these expressions? In its space, I can take p lim of mu of a t minus n a t minus two n a t minus k n a. You remember this is the expression for Furstenberg summary. If I will, can get for any p equal p plus p, <coughs> this is positive, which is true. This implies that good. And form an IP star set. So we are getting something new in, from the point of view of this third principle of Ramsey theory. Not only you get configurations, but because of this fact, by the way, it's non trivial. This is stronger than Furstenberg Katznason theorem. But later they proved another result which can be formulated this way. Okay, so it's so-called IP summary theorem. So in linear case, this is first and more sense. But I can write n square here, and then cube here, and whatever, into the case, say. This will be a special case of the theorem which I have as Randall McCutcheon. This is already polynomial IP theorem. And this is already. Can you put, can you put, replace zero with a quantitative, uh, measure of mu squared or something. Oh, that's too good, but with some constant. Let me write it here with a good question mark. Let me make it in red. That would be so good. So I will be talking on Friday about how good would be to have not only large set of ends, but non-trivial intersection here. It leads to applications. And depending on where you are, it may be open question. And at this positive note, I want to finish my talk. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Uh, so my question is, uh, you mentioned that uh, one of the are some semi-groups here. So is this business with ultra filters this approach is, can it be generalized to uh, uh, non-abelian? Semi-groups? Very good question, and answer is positive. So if you would be interested. So now I'm answering the question, so I can take my time, right? <laughs> 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 Within reason, yes. Okay. So, <laughs> so let me give you an example. Very good question. So indeed, whatever we showed uh, applies to beta G for G say for convenience, let G be a countable semi group or group even. Take beta g, define it similarly. You can do anything we showed. Uh, I don't know how you will define squares there, but uh, other things are uh, very natural and uh, correct up to a reason. So here is the result that you can prove. I will erase maybe here. So you take T sub g now, action of some group. So measure preserving on x, b, mu, and you may try to do many things of multiple recurrence that we did for z actions. For example, how about mu of a intersection t, g, a, bigger or equal than mu square minus of a minus epsilon. Is it true? Even if my group is not amenable, some people maybe know here what is amenable. So for amenable theory, I take Cesaro averages. But suppose my group is totally general. Do I know that this is true? 
Actually, it is true, and you don't need ultra filters. It's true. Existence of that G follows from level intersectivity theorem. But if I want to know that such G for which it happens is large, and what would be good notion of largeness in abstract semigroup? IP starness is good notion of large. You see, I, if my group is not amenable, I would have difficulties defining large sets there. If it is amenable, there exists, now I'm talking a little bit high tech, but for amenable groups, and amenable groups are all commutative groups are amenable, and not only they. But for amenable groups, you have invariant mean sitting on all sets. There you have notion of largeness. But if my group is something like free group, which is non-amenable, how do you define large sets? But if ultra filters are available, and they can define them the same way, and if I have important ultra filters are available, and I can define them some way, I have new notions of largeness. And if I can prove theorems like before, with this quantifier for any, you remember, for any p equal p plus p, in this case, maybe I should write p times p because I'm in general group, I will get this result. Namely, is IP star. And this is again a beginning. So that's already actually something you will not get any other way, I think. But what is interesting, you could ask about next iteration. One has to decide how to ask it. And I will talk about this on Friday, don't worry. <laughs> uh, but uh, you can start looking in general multiple recurrence phenomena. And the very good question is, Oh, fact is, which I will try to explain. You know what is one-dimensional semi-ready? And I hinted about multi-dimensional semi-ready. But when you deal with more general groups, it's easier to define multi-dimensional version than one-dimensional version. And we'll see why. Yes, please. Uh, oh. I think we have to. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so we have a question here as well. Yes, uh, could you, um, in the definition of error, uh, do we have minus n in the power of t? Uh, definition of? Uh, it is on the right blackboard. The top one. Top one. Uh, at the second top, one. Uh, second line. Here uh, I wrote a square without any minus because uh, each time I deal with polynomials, I will assume that I deal with uh, invertible transformation. If my transformation uh -huh. is invertible, I don't have this. It's historical aberration to write minus because Historically, people wanted to deal with not necessarily invertible transformations. For purposes of uh, multiple recurrence theory and applications, let's be happy assuming the transformations are invertible. If it's invertible, I can write here minus, it doesn't matter. And I can write any, let me write, any polynomial G of N, where G of N has zero at zero. It will be still true. And my G O N may have negative first coefficient. Doesn't matter. So the result which I presented as this uh, primitive case of Sharkozy applies to any polynomial. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, you asked me to uh, the, the question about general generalization of Heinlein. Yes. So you have uh, something concrete in mind. If not, I will start speculating. <laughs> so Heinemann is at the last word, right? So Heinemann is already infinite everything. Is what else to, to what? Heinemann is already so good that we showed how nicely it follows from from high recurrence iteration of ideology. But in principle, you could think about. You see, here we allowed sums, and uh, maybe we should allow sums with some weights. Maybe and one plus two and two plus three and three. Blah, 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 plus k and k. It's true. There are uh, infinitary versions of Heinemann, which can be formulated with some, in some matrix form. And uh, there, is, there are still open questions there, because it's already a huge world. Some things are good, some not. Factorial factor, like, uh, there, there is some, there are possibilities to making this linear combinations instead of just some generators. And uh, there is some life there. And there are non-trivial results. With group theory? That's a, a group is no torsion group. It's the same story. In torsion case, you have to start modifying 
what you want. Okay. Any questions? Yes, there is a question. Uh, so my question concerns uh, Hindman and this sequence Ni, which is uh, found using uh, special ultra filter, but we have a choice of choice these special ultra filters, and maybe uh, choosing more proper ultra filters, we can uh, deduce some special properties of this sequence. And one and two and three etc. Maybe it will be not so sparse. For example, something like this can be achieved this way. So to find some special properties of this sequence and I to be not so sparse. For example. Well, in general, no. In particular, and that's an exercise. I should not hope to get sequence and I to be of positive density. That's totally hopeless. There are some interesting possibilities there, but uh, I don't think that ultra-filter proof will help at all. So I already confessed yesterday. When it comes to finitary bounds, especially of log logish nature, specialist, local specialists do it better. But Hyman theorem is infinitary theorem, so I don't think there are any bounds at all. And I think it's a good question. Uh, in, for this, any finite partition, how sparse can be set of generators of AP? I don't have any answer, and I think it's a very good question. So, um, well, so, so you mentioned this general functional analytic principle that allows us to, recent, to consider, uh, so, so to replace n by n squared or by any by, by another polynomial in, uh, so, so here. Um, so results of this kind. Yes. Yes, but, but still. Uh, well, this being a, like a generalization of Sarkozy, uh, we are still bound by the intersectivity condition. Right, especially when you take IP limits, or indeed P limits. There is a notion of IP limit which is similar and more elementary, or more or less advanced. But uh, yes, this is important. You see IP sets, they don't like shifts. Yeah, yes, so, so basically, okay, so, so but my question was more how, how does this uh, condition show up in the, it's a bit vague, but how does this condition show up in the underlying functional analysis? Or? No, the, the point is that when you take P lim of unitary operator, say UN square, this will be some projection operator, I don't tell you on what, but on something, okay? And this is now in weak topology of Hilbert space. If u is unitary, I apply it to function. So f is in some Hilbert space, and u is unitary operator in Hilbert space to itself. And this is quadratic ergodic theorem where I replaced zero limit by p limit. And that's, this depends on, uh, on the polynomial. And, uh, the fact that uh, my polynomial has zero at zero helps. And you can take even one dimensional case. Think about complex numbers and what would be P lim. Let me write it. This I thought I will do it. No chance, but I will write P lim of n alpha is zero. Alpha is in torus. P lim of n alpha is zero. But and P lim of say n square alpha is zero. That I also wanted to do today, but no chance. But if I would write here n square plus one times alpha. We did n square minus one times alpha. The limit would be alpha, not zero. So getting this projection, in this case getting zero, because it's additive notation, it's uh, important that you take p lim along polynomials having zero at zero. By the way, this is easy exercise, and this is not. But this is true. Again, it is for any p equal p plus. This, by the way, so I just will tell you, because this whole sequence of lectures cannot give justice to any topic, really, but I want you to generate feelings. The feeling that I want you to generate from this small remark is that if you use p limbs, you can get Diophantine approximation. You can get applications to Diophantine life, because you are in torus with an alpha mod 1, and then square alpha mod 1. And maybe you can uh, strengthen classical wild theorem on equidistribution of polynomials you can. So this is behind. Okay. Questions in, in Kiev? Yes. 
Hello, everybody. Again, uh, I have small and again stupid question because I work also with topology and topological theory. And uh, uh, the longer I work with this, uh, more often I came to such a question. Whether topolo topological theory is some practical thing or it is just a matter for mathematical speculation. Could you uh, say some thoughts about it from your side? Okay, thank you for asking. So uh, topology today is classical science and uh, we're already at the stage of applying it. You still can uh, maybe do non-trivial research about super duper para compact spaces. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, they have so much interesting apparatus and material that what we see here is very nice applications of uh, some basic topological ideas. One of them is convergence along filters, indeed along ultra filters, which is even better. And so from that point of view, it's similar to the way we do today uh, apply functional analysis. There are two uh, sub areas. First of all, you can study, say, geometry of Banach spaces. It's very deep and trivial thing. But if you want to apply functional analysis, you need to introduce operators. And operators in Banach spaces, this is infinite dimensional linear algebra, enormously useful. Whereas this linear algebra today in my talk here, unitary operator, uh, acting on Hilbert space, and I take P limbs. So this is unification of some easy ideas from functional analysis, that's compactness of uh, unit sphere, unit ball, and uh, P limits. And P limits uh, is a very topological creature. So I think there is still a lot of chances for topology to, to be applicable in the rest of our life. But I'm, I'm sure that there are some deep areas insiders to work. Here I am not special. Questions here? Yes? Um, is there any hope for a density version of Feynman's theorem? I thought I proved it to you. Yes. So the answer is yes. The theorem that we proved is take any idempotent ultrafilter, it's a measure, set which is large in sense of this notion of largeness will contain IP set. That's density where? Yeah, the word I guess I'd be more interested in like some like possibility of maybe quantitative results. Because we use Zorn slam right and things like that which kind of kill any No again so if you want some estimates on the size of N eyes here I don't think it's easy to do anyway. But uh, notion of largeness which is behind Feynman is very visible from, I hope, from today's presentation. It's being large in sense of a measure which is given by n idempotent ultrafield. Of the measure given by n idempotent ultrafield. Yes? Uh, is there any other characterization of its sets can be large in this sense? Large for, is there any other characterization of its sets can be large for an idempotent ultrafield? What does it mean? Ah, hmm. So here is a curious. Again, topological algebra type result. You see what, let me stress, what we proved is, you take this partition, you take a fixed idempotent outer filter, one set is large, and this set we proved contains a subset, which is a P set. This subset doesn't have to be P large. Nothing from our proof indicates it, and indeed it's not true. But there is a theorem which says that for any IP set finite sums of an I, there exists P equal P plus P such that finite sums of an I is a member of this P. So any IP set is actually large set for some P. And any P which is as important contains any set which is like also contains a subset. So it's two-way street but delicate, right? Okay. 
Is there any more questions in Kiev? No, I don't think so. Thank you. Okay, so let's thank you.